Hello students, I welcome you all once again back to this course on software engineering. Let us continue our discussion with the requirements engineering process. To recap a little bit, we have talked about requirements engineering specification document, requirements engineering process itself, how do we actually jot down the requirements for a specific system that needs to be developed. The requirements is going to change inevitably. That is what we have finally concluded on in one of our previous sessions. Why does this requirement actually change? What are the reasons for the change in requirement? Requirements can change due to many reasons. The first and the foremost reason for a requirement change could be that the change in the technical or the social environment wherein the system that has been developed has been put into place. That could be the first and foremost reason. What uh, we have thought about the requirement specification while developing the system could change when the same system is put into use into the working environment, into the actual working environment of the system. <coughs> Next, this requirements also could change because there could be for a large system, there could be different community of people who are actually interacting with the system, who could be using the system. Each of these people, each of these communities will have a different understanding of the system, will need the system for a different functionality and therefore, the requirement could change. So, uh, of the many reasons, these two are the reasons uh, which we have seen that requirements change. When requirements change, it should be possible that the change in requirement be incorporated as a part of our requirement specification and incorporate this change in also the other processes of software development activity. Because of these changes in the requirement, the requirements we say is going to evolve. Now, what is this process of requirements evolution? Requirements evolution process as you can see here is is uh, about the initial understanding of the problem which gives rise to the initial requirements for the system that has to be developed. We have one specific understanding of why we require a certain software. What should the software do? Based on this understanding, the initial requirements for the software system to be developed is given. And this initial requirement, while jotting down the requirement, while uh, doing the requirements engineering, in one of the activities, we could realize that there is a changed understanding of the problem. The requirements itself would change the understanding of a problem or the discussions, the meetings that we have could change the understanding of the problem. Talking to the customer or the end user could change the understanding of the problem which will give rise to changed requirements. Over a period of time, the requirements are going to evolve. From the initial understanding of the problem to the changed understanding of the problem, we get the initial requirements which finally gives us the changed requirements. This is the requirements evolution process. This is not just about the requirements evolution process. Based on the requirements evolution, based on the requirements evolution, from the requirements evolution perspective, the requirements also can be classified as enduring requirements and volatile requirements. We have seen many different types of requirements already, the functional requirements, the non-functional requirements, the domain requirements and each of them had their own significance in the requirements documentation. Similarly, we also have enduring requirement and volatile requirements which, which are the requirements that are classified, classified based on the evolution perspective of the requirements. So, what is an enduring requirement? Enduring requirement are relatively stable requirements, those requirements that do not change frequently, something that is going to be fixed for a certain period of time that is the enduring requirement. Some process or some uh, activity of an organization which is going to uh, define the working of an organization, working process or procedure of an organization may not change for a long time, right. So, that is called as an enduring requirement. As an example, let us just think about a payroll system for an employee, wherein in this payroll system, 
something that is not going to change is his earnings and his deductions. Right? He will have earnings every month, he will have deductions every month, something that is not going to change for a long time. But what is a volatile requirement? A volatile requirement are likely to change, these are the requirements that are likely to change during development. Once you have written down the requirements and started developing the system, these requirements could change. These requirements for example, could be defined by the government as a policy. We have income tax deduction for an employee, currently it is some percentage, over a period of time the government may decide to change the percentage and hence the requirement could change. The requirement uh, that, uh, that, that the deduction should follow for the income tax, um, income tax component could change. Okay. So, that is called as a volatile requirement. So, enduring requirement are relatively stale, uh, stable than the volatile requirements. Now, based on the definition of volatile requirements, now we have agreed upon that requirements can change, but based on that we have different types of requirements. There are four types of requirements, which for the first one is the mutable requirement. We call it the mutable requirement because this is the requirements that is going to change because of the change in the environment in which the organization is currently operating. So, the requirements that change because of changes to the environment in which the organization is currently operating is called as the mutable requirement. For example, let us take a hospital, uh, a hospital system. If I build a general hospital system, the patient care methodology that is used by hospital systems may change and thus it may require different type of treatment information that is to be stored or that is to be collected for a system. Okay. So, that is a mutable requirement. Next type is called as the emergent requirements. This emergent requirements may emerge, the word itself says these are the requirements that can emerge based on the customer's understanding of the system. It could uh, be an initial understanding or a revised understanding of the system, but the requirements may change based on this improved understanding of the system or changed understanding of the system and develops during the system development. These are the emer emerging requirements that arise during the development of the system. The design process also, the design uh, activity also may lead to the emergent requirements. They may reveal some new kind of a requirements that may emerge while the design activity is in the process. Okay. Next, the consequential requirement. Consequential requirement though as the uh, term, as it is termed, it is as a consequence of some activity. Now, what is it? Requirements that result as a consequence of introduction of a com computer system into the environment, into the environment that may lead to any kind of a change in the working of the organization. That is the consequential requirement. When you have a certain computer system, when you have your system that is developed and you put it in the already working, in between the already working systems, the organizational process, the organizational working, the business process in the organization may tend to change as a consequence of introduction of the system. And that is the requirements that might, that, might, that might arise for your system to be redesigned or redeveloped in order to uh, that which is called as consequential, consequential requirements. Next is the compatibility requirement. Now, these requirements, these are the requirements that actually depend on the business processes that are defined for a particular organization. Okay. So, as these change, the com when the business processes in an organization change, the compatibility requirements are also going to change and they need to evolve based on the organizational to system. You would have developed a certain software system for an organization today, but the business process, the methodology of working of the organization itself may change after two months or three months. We do not know, but the system needs to incorporate the requirements for change in business process in order to 
be compatible with the working of the organization and this is called as the compatibility requirements. So, this is the requirements classification based on evolution. Next, we have seen a pro the requirements analysis process in one of our sessions previously wherein we I would like to reiterate on two other important techniques for requirements analysis. Let us see what is the new technique that we are going to actually uh, understand today in order to carry out the requirements analysis process. The first kind of a technique is called as scenarios. Now, what are these scenarios? In order to do requirements analysis, some real life examples of how a system can be used can be defined as a part of analysis process. This is called as scenarios. For a system that needs to be developed, you give a complete definition of how the system is going to be used. And it is a complete description and this description should include what is the starting situation of the working of the system, how what is the flow of events, what are the sequence of events that are going to occur when somebody uses this system a description of what can actually go wrong within the system, what are the actions to be taken when something goes wrong, what are the concurrent activities that this system is going to perform, then a description of the state when a certain scenario completes. So, basically scenarios describe the entire sequence of events during the interaction of a possible customer with the real life system. That is called as a scenario. Now, based on these scenarios, we can make you, we can do requirements analysis. How can we do the requirements analysis based on a scenario? Let us take an example of our uh, mental health care patient management system, which we have discussed in uh, one of our sessions. So, let us see what a scenario looks like for collecting the medical history of a patient in this uh, patient management system. We talk about the initial assumption for this uh, patient management system as a part of the scenario. Now, the patient has uh, he's seen a medical receptionist. So, we have a receptionist who is going to interact with this patient management system who has created a record in the system and collected patient's personal information such as his name, address, age, etcetera, etcetera. So, this, med this uh, medical receptionist whatever we are talking about is responsible for collecting his personal information. Also, the assumption is that a nurse is also logged on to the system and she is collecting his medical history. Normal working of this system, normal operation of the system, the scenario is, is that the nurse searches for the patient by family name. It, his name has been added by the re receptionist, but the nurse is going to search for the patient name that she wants to collect the medical history, history for by his family name because the family name is termed to be unique, she searches for by family name. Now, again if there is more than one patient with the same family name, it could happen. So, the given name and the date of birth are usually used to identify the patient. Now, based on the activity of the nurse, we have come up, uh, come up with many requirements here. The nurse should be able to search for the patient by his family, uh, family name. If more than one exists, there should be an option for her to search using given name and date of birth. The, uh, the combination of given name and date of birth might not match, it would be very rare cases that the name and date of birth will match, right, to, to identify the patient. Now, we have come up based on this scenario, we have come up with a new requirement. The nurse chooses the menu option to add medical history. Now, we have now a interface requirement wherein we need a menu option in order to help the nurse to add a new medical history for the patient whose name has been added by the receptionist. The nurse then follows a series of prompts from the system okay, to enter information about consultations elsewhere. Now, series of prompts from the system 
Now we have a requirement that the system should guide her in the process of entering the patient medical history details, right? To enter the information about consultations elsewhere on mental health problems, which is a free input text. She can input it as a text in the text form. Existing medical con uh, conditions, maybe she selects conditions from the menu. Now this is another requirement. A text input should be uh, sh uh, should be given to enter the consultations that the patient has made elsewhere other than this medical center, and existing the conditions she might be able to select it from a drop down menu possibly. <coughs> then medications that are currently being taken, which also can be selected from the menu, allergies. Allergies could be different for different people, therefore it could be free text and home life in form of in, in form of a uh, input form, right? right. So uh, the nurse is going to collect all these details in order to input the patient medical history into the system. So this scenario that we have talked about now gave rise to many different functionalities of the system, the requirements that are uh, the, the requirements in order to make these functionalities into development activity. We got all these things as a part of this scenario. Let us now see, sorry, let us now see how can we represent this scenario in form of a graphical model. Unified modeling language uh, provides us with what is called as a use case diagram. We have already discussed this once before saying that use case diagrams help us to depict the interaction of the users of a system with the system, right. What functionality each user is going to carry out is in form of a certain use case. So these use cases are a scenario based technique which is provided to us by unified modeling language and this UML identifies who are the actors. The actors are the people or the systems or any other entity who is directly or indirectly involved with the interaction of the system, right. So actors in an interaction and which describes the interaction itself, how are they interacting, what functionality are they going to use in order to use this system that is the interaction itself. Then a set of use cases is going to be described based on the scenario that is uh, based on the uh, kind of uh, functionality that is to be developed and all the possible interactions with the system are noted down as a part of this use case diagram. Then use case diagram is a high level graphical model. This can also be supplemented by a more detailed tabular description. Tabular descriptions are one way of putting up these uh, system requirements which we have already seen before. Then there is another kind of a UML diagram which is called as a sequence diagram. Sequence diagram, uh, probably we have seen the sequence diagram when we were talking about how to withdraw cash from a ATM system, right. The sequence diagrams are those diagrams that specify the sequence of activities that are involved in a particular transaction, okay. So who in this sequence diagram, we have a timeline, we have an entity, we have, sequ we have sequence of events which are um, produced over a uh, timeline, over a sequence of time, okay. So we also depict the actor of the system as a part of sequence diagram, who is interacting with the system as a part of the sequence diagram. Now, in the UML use case diagram, these use case diagrams can also be, can, it can also make use of tabular specification if it wants to specify some requirements information in more detail or it can make use of sequence diagram in order to show the sequence of the event processing in a certain system. So it can make use of alternate techniques also as a part of the UML diagrams. Okay, this is the use cases for a MHC PMS system, a sample use case this does not cover the entire uh, medical health care uh, patient management system. This is a sample use case. Now we just saw the scenario in one of the previous slides where we talked about who? Medical receptionist, we talked about a nurse, we talked about 
a doctor who is going to see the patient next when once the nurse is going to uh, add his medical history the doctor is going to see the patient right so we see that whoever is interacting with this patient medical um, uh, patient management system is called as a actor here the actor is represented in form of a stick man here with the name of the actor below it okay a medical receptionist is is the one actor nurse is another actor doctor is another actor and manager who sits behind the scene and manages the information is manages all the information at the back end about the patient is the manager okay this we didn't see in the scenario but it evolved uh, when you were drawing use case we needed somebody to manage all this information at the back end to generate the report hence we had a new actor called manager now what are these eclipses these uh, these eclipses here they represent the use cases okay they are the representation for use cases each of these use case define one activity medical receptionist does what register the patient so registering the patient is one use case she can view the personal information of the of the patient so that is also possible so that is also another activity that she can uh, she needs the system for she is going to interact with the system for these two purposes these become the activity and that is possible for her through the manager through the manager who will allow her to see the personal information of a certain patient the nurse can see the record of the patient and edit the record for the patient edit the record for the patient right she can act actually add as patient uh, medical history the nurse is the one who is going to add it right so generally when you enter into a clinical system it's the nurse who is going to check all your uh, parameters maybe a bp heart rate etc and enter it into a system and then send it as a file to the doctor so that's the actual scenario here and therefore this is uh, doctor here who is accessing the record that exists for a certain patient and he can also edit uh, edit the record and set up a consultation time for this patient the doctor can also generate report for he has the rights to he needs the report in, in case he needs to know what the patient history is which are his previously visited clinics what medication he has been previously taking he needs to generate a report for that and hence he can generate a report so this is a use case diagram for the medical health care patient management system for a certain scenario for a for one component of the system okay this is how a use case diagram will look like to continue with requirements analysis yet another kind of a requirement analysis process is called as ethnography ethnography is very interesting because it is a little different from the other techniques that we have already seen other than specifying the natural language structured natural language tabular form etc ethnography uh, deals with something a little different from the other techniques in ethnography the social scientist we say or the person who is going to gather the requirements the person who is going to do requirements elicitation or requirements di discovery for a certain system to be developed he is going to spend time observing and analyzing how people actually work in the organization so he is going there are, there will be a team of people or a certain person who is deployed into the actual working environment of the system that is to be developed and placed in right so he is going to analyze on how the people actually work there based on that he is going to get inputs on the requirements of the system in the working domain in the working domain now people there do not have to explain or articulate their work to him he himself as an individual is going to experience what process they are following in order to perform a certain activity it could be entry of a marks it could be generation of a student progress report this is the team of people or a individual is going to sit there in the organization if the process needs to be automated they see what is the current manual process that is happening 
and jot down the requirements in order to automate this process. Okay. Then what are the social and other organizational factors of importance that is to be considered in order to develop the system can be observed from the working environment itself. So, it is, uh, it is completely different from bringing a person, a customer to your organization, talking to him, interacting with him, be it a closed interview or an open interview. You interact with him and write down the requirements and it is completely different in going into the environment where the system needs to be placed and actually analyzing the requirements that are required. So, ethnographic studies have shown that work is usually richer and more complex than it is suggested by our model, even the simplest system model that we develop. Okay. Whatever system model, whatever design model, be it very simple, very organized, very detailed, very, uh, very even uh, it is going to give every detail of the system that needs to be developed. Now, more than all these things, nothing is going to match you, uh, you as a person going there to the working environment, sitting there along with the people and seeing what, how they work and analyzing the requirements for that particular uh, system that needs to be developed. Okay, what is the scope of ethnography? That is the definition of ethnography. What is the scope? Now, because you are going to sit there, you are going to derive the requirements from the way the people in that organization actually work than me assuming things about how they work or how I want them to work after I put, put the system in place. Correct? It, this makes a lot of difference. Instead of changing the way people work because they have to use my system, you go in there and you develop a system to ease the way of their working right now. Right? So, requirements that are derived from cooperation and awareness of other people's activities. You could just interact with a customer in your office and uh, develop the requirement specification, you know, write down the requirement specification, but when you go there and realize there are much more people than you assumed who are going to interact with this system, more requirements can be analyzed in the initial stages itself of the software development process itself. And this would reduce lot of rework cost, be it at any stage of software development activity. Right? So, you are going to get the awareness of what other people are doing and what can lead to changes in which we do things, in the way in which we can actually do things. Right? So, ethnography is effective for understanding the existing process of operation for a certain activity or for a certain organization. But what it cannot do is that it cannot identify new features that can be added to the system. Now, we, what are we doing here? We are concentrating more on what is going on there and what can be automated. We do not concentrate on what new feature can be added such that it can ease their process more. Correct? New features cannot be thought of using ethnograph ethnographic uh, activity. Okay. Ethnography is also important because it can sit together with prototyping. It can use, be used along with prototyping techni technique for the requirements analysis. So, if you just look at this picture here, ethnographic analysis your due analysis provides the inputs for all the meetings and ethnography is a part of this system prototyping here. System prototyping gets input from the ethnographic analysis that, that you do. Right? Now, system prototypes here because they get inputs from the ethnographic analysis, the number of prototypes incremental delivery, it gives you so many different prototypes at different stages you know, so that uh, the customer can see the prototype, suggest changes, do modification, more requirements can be incorporated, etcetera. The number of prototypes that you release, you release do after doing, after getting input from a ethnographic analysis can be reduced, okay, because you are actually taking the prototype and putting it in the place of work 
and doing an ethnographic analysis of how it is working in that environment and getting back the input for your next prototyping. Okay. During your generic system development leads to your system prototyping process and these prototypes each time a prototype is re released is evaluated for its functionality, for its uh, requirement fulfillment and the, folk, the uh, ethnographic analysis also gives inputs to system pro, uh, prototyping, prototyping and now when the prototype is used, you can now focus on the problems or the new requirements that may arise based on its working and put it across in meetings, de, uh, in, in uh, debriefing meetings which gives focused ethno ethnography output for the next prototype that is going to be developed. Okay. So, this is how ethnography helps the prototyping technique for requirements analysis process. Now, requirements analysis process is done. Uh, we have analyzed the requirements, we have written the requirements, requirements documentation we have seen, we have seen a sample requirements documentation, how a requirements specification should look like. Now, we have also agreed that requirements change over time. And we have also seen what is the evolution process, what are the different types of requirements that needs to be changed and we have also agreed upon saying that if there is a change in the requirement, it, has, it needs to be incorporated, right? it needs to be incorporated. So, who is going to take care of all these changes in the requirement, whether a certain change has to be implemented, whether the, a new requirement that has uh, arise, whether it is going to fit as a part of this system, have we agreed upon providing this requirement as a functionality in the system, is it going to cost more for the system in order to incorporate this requirement, all these things need to be decided upon. Who is going to take this decision? This decision can be taken by requirements management team. Now, we have a team which is called as a requirements management team, just like how we have a project uh, manager, we do have a requirements manager whose role is mainly to identify the uh, need for a certain requirement, identify the changes in requirement, identify whether a certain requirement needs to be incorporated or not, he, much more than this, much his decisions, he is basically supposed to take some decisions based on requirements engineering process. Okay. The uh, essential first stage of a requirements act management activity is called as requirements management planning. You are going to plan on how you are going to manage the requirement. Now, what is it that you are going to do as a part of this requirements management planning? As a part of this, decisions will be taken. What based on what? What decisions will be taken? Decisions will be taken during this stage and they will be related to identifying the requirements uniquely. Requirements should be unique, it should not contradict with one another, right? Every requirement should have a purpose for being there for the system development. A change management process, again because requirements tend to change, it is very much required that we have a management process that is going to uh, take care of the changing requirements. Then the traceability policies, can you trace back a certain functionality of a system to its requirement, the traceability policy. Then what are the different tools that I require in order to do a requirements engineering process, what tools do I require? that is the case tool support that needs to be uti utilized during the requirements engineering process, the decision to be taken is by is the responsibility of the requirements manager. These are the different kinds of decisions. Now, this requirements management uh, planning as I told you, the, re the first and the foremost level of requirements management is the requirements identification. As a, this requirements must be uniquely identified because it, so that it can be cross-referenced with other requirements, 
right. So, you have a list of requirements, no two requirements should tell the same thing. That is about uniquely identifying the requirement, okay, or no two requirements should contradict each other. That is uniquely identifying the requirement. So, requirements identification is a very important phase in requirements management planning. A change management um, a process, now why is a change management process required? We know we are going, requirements can evolve, we have seen the evolution process, change is inevitable again and therefore, you have to assess what is the impact of this change in requirement to the organization, be it in terms of time or be it in terms of the cost of the changes. Is it going to cost a lot of money and time for the organization in order to incorporate a certain change that has, certain change in requirement itself that has come up during some stage of the software development activity, down the activi activity process uh, cycle, right. So, this change management uh, process itself is a set of activities, we will see that in a while, it is a set of activities and that those activities are there to assess whether uh, the impact, what is the outcome of incorporating this change and what are the cost. Uh, problems that is that this requirement is going to create as a part of this change. Traceability policies are those policies that define this relationship between existing requirements. So, requirements system uh, design uh, that sh uh, is going to the require the system design is going to incorporate the requirements that is actually a part of the requirement specification. Now, what are the relationship between the uh, existing requirements? If there are four requirements, how these four requirements are dependent on each other or independent of each other? That is the traceability policy, okay. These are the policies that are implemented as the part of organization and you can write down these policies and it becomes a management activity, core management activity to implement these policies traceabilities pro policies for a certain requirement. Because the design gets input from these requirements specification, it is important for us to relate these requirements with between each other, okay. Then tool support, as we talked about, these tools may range from a specialized tool for managing the requirements itself, if it is a huge system, lot of activities could be going on in parallel concurrent activities could be possible and therefore, you would require some complex kind of a tool in order to manage the changing requirements. If it is large system, again there would be varied amount of, um, varied type of people who are interacting with the system at different uh, skill levels, at different uh, uh, employability levels, etcetera, right. So, when there are different kinds of people who are interacting, different kinds of changes emerge and this is why you should know what kinds of tools are required to manage the change in varied kind of requirements, right. So, the tool support, it could be as complex as that or it could be as simple as a spreadsheet using of a simple spreadsheet or a database system that is uh, actually required for managing the requirements. So, that tool support is also a part of the requirements management planning. Now, I told you we will just see the change management. As I told, the change management is a set of activities by itself. The what are the activities that are in the requirements change management? You have identified problem, the identified problem gives rise to problem analysis and the specification of change. We see that the understanding of the problem changes during evolution, right. The same thing will give us the change in specification of the requirement. Then an analysis is made on the change, what kind of change and uh, is required, what is it possible to do it, all types of analysis be it cost analysis, be it, be it feasibility analysis of that change can be done here in the next stage and then decide whether the change has to be implemented or not. If the change is implemented, then the revised requirement is the output, uh, is the result of this change management process, okay. So, this is how a requirements change management 
pro activity looks like. We will see each of these process in detail. Now, whether a certain requirements change has to be accepted or not, it depends on problem analysis, it depends on change analysis and change implementation. Okay. Problem analysis and change specification during this during this phase, the problem or the change propo proposal, the problem, if you have identified a problem with the existing system and you want a change in the requirement or when there is a proposal to change the actual requirements of the system, it is going to be checked whether it is valid or not. That is the first activity. Now, this is fed back to whoever is requesting the change. Okay. So, you have done an analysis and you have given the change specification and you have seen whether it is valid or not. You are going to give this input, this uh, outcome whatever you just did, the result of whatever activity you just did to the change requester who is going to respond with a more specific requirement change or he, must, he might always decide to withdraw the proposed request. From his point of view, he would have proposed a change and given you a proposal and based on your analysis inputs, he might actually think of not doing it at all based on the outcome. Okay. So, this is whatever analysis you do, problem analysis you do is given to the change requester for his decision on whether he really wants it or not. Okay. He might as well seeing what you, your analysis, he might as well come up with change that specifies uh, where, uh, more specifically which specifies more requirement changes. He might come up with another change document. Change analysis and costing, uh, might, uh, change analysis and costing is a phase wherein the traceability of the information is actually traced. Okay. And the general knowledge of the systems requirement is in the proposed chain, in the proposed chain you are going to assess the traceability information and general knowledge of the system requirement. Once analysis is comple completed, a decision is made whether or not to proceed with the requirements change. So, change analysis, you do traceability and uh, you assess the knowledge of the system, general knowledge of the system requirements and then you decide on whether to do it or not do it. Now, change implementation, you decided to change, right. Now, where do you change it? You first have to change it in the requirements document. The requirements document and wherever necessary, the change has to be implemented. Okay. The system design and implementation may need to be changed as well when once you accept a change in requirement. So, therefore, the two other activities that we just saw problem analysis, change analysis, costing, etcetera, these two phases require thorough understanding, thorough activity has to be done in these two phases such that you decide that you are going to change the requirement and you should be able to implement the change when once you decide that you are going to accept the change in requirement. This implementation is not just about modifying the requirement document, it is also about the design and implementation part of it that needs to be modified. Because we are changing the document, we, we should always have a requirement specification document organized into um, good into sections. We saw an example of one of the student information management system document in the previous session. That document, if you remember, was so very well organized in form of sections. They had a user in, in, uh, interaction section, who is a student user, who a records employee, who is an employee user. They had a section for interfaces, they had a section for functional requirement, non-functional requirement, definition of how a non-functional requirement could give rise to a functional requirement. It was so neatly organized into section. Wherever there was a change in that system, I am sure that it would be very easy for the uh, developer or for the systems engineer to actually incorporate the change as a part of the document. So, it is our duty to maintain the requirements document in such a way that changes can easily be incorporated as a part of this document, not reorganizing the entire document as a whole. Okay. And implementation part of the uh, 
software also should be taken care of when you have to make a certain change, when you have to make a certain a new requirement in corporation as a part of your working model. Okay. Then let us talk a little bit about traceability. There are uh, three types of traceability. One is called as the source traceability, the other one is the requirements traceability and uh, the design traceability. So, source traceability whether you can trace back to the source where the requirement was elicited. Requirements traceability is whether you have uh, uh, requirements, whether the actual requirement can be traced in the uh, during the development of the system. Design traceability that the, uh, the system design can be traced etcetera. To do traceability, we make use of what is called as traceability matrix that give us the relationship between the different requirements of the same requirements uh, specification for a certain system. For large system, a case tool can be used in order to capture the requirements and their traceability details. For case tool supports, you can uh, make use of uh, case tools to do your storage to do your change management and your traceability management. So, for your uh, requirement storage it should because it should be requirement storage should uh, whatever requirements that you are storing should be secure and it should be managed so that everybody who is involved in requirements engineering should access it. So, you should require you might require a case tool support and change management because change is inevitable you cannot do it all alone tools are required and traceability management. So, to retrieve the links between the requirements, you could make use of a case tool. Uh, this is about uh, the requirements engineering management process um, in as a part of module 1. Thank you.